If I tried to list all of General Paul Nakasone's accomplishments in his over three decades of service to the nation, it would use up all our interview time. So I'll just sum it up by saying that uh, when it comes to national and cybersecurity, he's been there and done that. Uh, his roles have ranged from command at the company, battalion, and brigade level to assignments in the U.S., Korea, Afghanistan, and Iraq, to finally serving as both commander of U.S. Cyber Command and director of the National Security Agency since 2018, during what has been inarguably one of the most dynamic times in not just cybersecurity history, but overall national security. General, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Peter. It's good to see you again. So um, let's jump right in. Uh, as you come to the end of uh, your time in military service, can you take us through how it started and evolved? What were some key lessons that you've learned along the way? Peter, uh, I was commissioned through the ROTC program at the end of the Reagan administration. So I enter an army as a career intelligence officer really at the kind of the height of the Cold War. Uh, and what I see is, first of all, the demise of the Soviet Union. Uh, I see the rise of the Balkans. And then I'm at the Pentagon on 9-11. And I think I would characterize everything in my military experience pre-9-11 and post-9-11. And so from the post 9-11, you know, opportunities like many of my peers to serve in Iraq and Afghanistan. But in 2007, I landed at the National Security Agency to command a brigade. Uh, and I just happened to be at a time and a place where cyber is taking off. Uh, I've seen our experiences in Iraq where we were able to bring signals intelligence to war fighters on the front end. And also seen in 2008, uh, the penetration of our classified networks. And so I'm there for the stand-up of U.S. Cyber Command. So uh, I guess a person that's been fairly lucky uh, in their experiences through their career. So let's look at um, what's changed over uh, that period of time. Um, let's break it down. Uh, what was the biggest change that you've seen within the military during that period and then secondly, I'd like to ask you, what's the biggest change in terms of the types of threats that you've been dealing with? Well, so for the military, I, again, I entered the military right after Goldwater Nichols has been signed. And I would tell you the dramatic change in our military is the ability to operate as a joint force. I come into a service you know, that's very parochial in the late 80s, but by the 90s, we have learned the lesson that it is all about being joint. Uh, and the way that we're going to do things in the future is through a joint force. And my experiences in Korea and Iraq and Afghanistan reinforce this idea that if we're going to have success, it's going to be part of the joint force. And with that comes this realization that with the joint force, we're able to take this concept, this tenet that we've always talked about, intelligence driving operations, and actually make it, make it real. And this is what we have done really since, I would say, since about 2005. So when you say make it real, can you give an, uh, a, a non-classified example to illustrate that for us? Yeah, I, I saw it specifically, you know, uh, in 2006, 2007, all the way in the, the mid-2000s in Iraq and Afghanistan, when you had, first of all, our special operations forces and then our conventional forces take what is you know, incredibly sensitive information from the National Security Agency and be able to utilize that in a series of missions where they're actually able to drive their operations, one mission, three missions, five missions, sometimes multiple missions in a night. And this is not just on our very elite operators, but also on our conventional forces. So let's talk about that threat side of things and the change in it. So over the course of your career, as you laid out, you know, you went from um, having to think about uh, the Warsaw Pact, Soviet Army, to then Iraq, to then um, insurgents, Taliban, to now great power competition. Um, talk to me about how it's not merely the way the threat has changed, but the way that you as a leader have to think about that threat. I think the last portion is really important, Peter, because uh, this idea of critical thinking, being dynamic in your thoughts, is something I've seen very successful leaders do throughout my career. Remember, you know, we come in with uh, really a, a bipolar world where we're all thinking about the fold of gap, 
Uh, we transitioned to counterinsurgency, violent extremist organizations, and then we're coming back to great power competition, where the lessons that you learn in the late 80s suddenly are coming back in you know, the mid 2000s. And from that, I, I think that I would say is that uh, you know, your ability to understand you know, what are your competitive advantages? How do you think differently about the threat? How do you apply our competitive advantages to the threat are what makes very successful leaders and obviously separates those that have been successful from those that have been less successful as well. So we've got some folks listening who um, weren't around for that uh, lessons from the 80s and the Warsaw Pact that are coming back. Um, what's a particular lesson that you see coming back from that period of a different kind of great power competition, but there are some parallels? Well, I think, you know, we uh, we come back to deterrence, right? I mean, deterrence is something we all studied uh, as we came into the military in the late 80s. It's something we practiced. I think we, you know, lost a little bit of our operational uh, knowledge of it, you know, as uh, counterterrorism and violent extremist organizations played out, and now it's coming back. But I think what's different and the way that I've seen it in cyberspace is it's not necessarily that our, you know, what we do have changed, but how we do it needs to change. And so when we think about deterrence, how do we use information differently? How do we use intelligence differently? How do we use our technology different to you know, be able to signal to our adversaries of our capabilities? So let's go um, into that area that is uh, fundamentally different because you know literally it didn't exist back then, which is um, having to develop cyber strategy. So you've been part of um, doing this at both an organizational but also a national level. Um, first, what do you see as the essential elements of cyber strategy? Peter, I've seen four different cyber strategies from our department, 2011, 2014, 2018, and now the, the latest one that's coming out uh, in the coming weeks. Really successful strategies, first of all, are able to depict the strategic environment in which we are in. Okay, that's one of the things that's necessary for a strategy. But the big piece that I think successful strategies have is being able to identify the one way or the one mean that we're gonna get to our ends much more successful. And let me give you an example. I think 2018 is a watershed moment in terms of the way the Department of Defense approaches cyber. Everything up to that, we were relatively passive. We'd have an intrusion, we would lose data, we would have an intruder in our networks, and then we would go to, to clean it up. In 2018, we said, this is gonna stop. We are going to have a much more proactive approach. This is defend forward. This is an idea of operating outside the United States to be in, in constant, uh, contact with our adversaries to understand what's going on. For US Cyber Command, this is persistent engagement, informing and acting. And so to your question is, you have to describe the strategic environment, but importantly, describe exactly the ways and the means that you're gonna get after to make a difference in what the strategic environment is telling us today. So that's a really interesting that you've been there to witness and, and been part of the creation of multiple different strategies. So um, I'd like to ask you, I'm going to put on my professor hat, I'd like to ask you um, to evaluate uh, not the strategy itself, but how we build strategy. What does the U.S. do well in terms of the building of strategy and what do we need to up our game on when it comes to this building, the process of developing strategy in cyberspace? I think the U.S. military uh, does very well at a doctrinal approach, a methodology upon which we build a strategy. We've done this. We have a doctrine that, that uh, identifies how we do it. As Army officers, you learn this in Leavenworth. You learn this at the Army War College. You learn this in your joint force training. It's very laid out. And I think we, we write a lot of strategies. I think the challenge that I see with strategy right now is that we tend to be so siloed within the military that we forget that there's, you know, there's other means upon which we can accomplish our outcomes. How do we look differently at the interagency? How do we look differently at the intelligence community? How do we look differently at the private sector? These are all incredibly important in the environment in which we live today, particularly in the domain in which I operate, which is cyberspace. If you're gonna write a strategy, you're not talking about the private sector, or you're not talking about international partners, what's the value of the strategy gonna be? I, I would say probably less than uh, what you're hopeful. And so I, I think the challenge that we have is we've gotta think broadly about how we're gonna bring different players into 
and, and make them a part of our strategy and ensure that we, you know, and somehow incorporate their contributions or what we need from uh, their contributions to be successful on our own ends. Thank you. So you're at a um, uh, important moment of transition, uh, both for the nation, but also for you personally. Uh, as you look back, what are you most proud of uh, in your tenure at Cyber Command and uh, the NSA? And in turn, um, are there any areas of uh, unfinished business, so to speak? Personally, I, I would go back to 2018, and it's the Russia Small Group. Um, I come out of my confirmation hearings knowing that uh, there's going to be a safe and successful election in the midterms in 2018, or there's going to be a new commander and a new director of NSA. Uh, and so we got after it very quickly. We brought together the best of NSA and U.S. Cyber Command and said, hey, this is our end. We're going to get a safe and successful election for the midterms in 2018. And what really kind of grew from that were a number of different ideas that set the course for us at both our agency and command. Things like hunt forward operations. You know, today we've done 50 different operations, 23 different countries, 77 different networks with partners to hunt for adversaries. This is an idea, again, that's, you know, akin to our defend forward, our persistent engagement. It also brings in this idea of the private sector. So in the fall of 2018, we say, Hey, we found all this malware. Let's look at a, you know, a, a civilian company to see if they've ever seen this malware before. So this private public partnership is actually demonstrated then. And so what grows from the Russia small group is, first of all, on the agency, this idea that we need a cybersecurity directorate. And a year later, we do that. What grows from it is that, hey, what we are doing is not going to change. We're going to do signals intelligence, cybersecurity, and cyber operations at both our agency and command. But the how is dramatically different. We're going to operate in the unclassified space. We're going to operate with public sector partners. We are going to be able to publish things like cybersecurity advisories that we release to the nation and the world. This is different. And this is all from the Russia small group. Let me talk a little bit about unfinished business. For us, uh, I've talked about China as the generational challenge for our nation. Our current generation, our children, our children's children. It is a different nation in terms of the competition that we are experiencing now with China. As we look to the future, my sense is, is that we will continue to have this very, very high level of competition. But if we want to ensure that the future is one where we're able to uh, protect our homeland and, and uh, continue to uh, protect our allies and partners, we have to address the challenge that is China. The diplomatic information, military, economic power of this nation is different than we've ever experienced. In terms of the agency, unfinished business for me is really focused on our people. In the next five years, we're gonna hire half of our civilian workforce. We have to think differently about talent management. How do we onboard people? How do we train people? How do we do hybrid work? How do we look at things like well-being that is you know, akin to what we saw, what we needed during COVID-19? And then on the command side, the unfinished business for us really is getting to sustained readiness. Our op tempo has increased dramatically. How do we take service-like authorities and blend them into what we are doing and get the experiences of a force that is always ready and always able to continue to do multiple missions at one time? This is the unfinished business for us, Peter. So as you know, I work in that um, space between both nonfiction, but also sometimes fictional future. So uh, I'm going to ask your help. Um, can you paint a scene of what cybersecurity and cyber warfare will look like 10 years from now? Um, what will be the same? What might be different? Let me begin with what I think the same is. Uh, I think success in the future will always go to uh, the nation or the, the activity that has the best people and are able to leverage the people uh, and being able to apply those people in a manner that uh, gets sufficiently to the end state that they're trying to reach. That's not going to change. I don't think that the nature of warfare is going to change in terms of being uh, violent and bloody and incredibly uh, uh, challenging for a nation state. But here's what I think is going to change. The fact that speed is going to change dramatically. Uh, we see it in our domain. What was once 
weeks has become days, what has become days have become hours. In the future, it will be down to seconds in terms of what we're going to have to be able to process, what we're going to have to be able to do. Secondly, my sense is that partnerships are going to change. If we are going to be successful, particularly in the domain in which I operate, cyberspace, we have to have a much broader range of partners. We have to have partners that are not only within our government, but are within the private sector, that are international partners, that are academic partners, that allow us to get after very, very tough challenges in a very quick manner. And the last thing that I think is going to change is, is obviously, I think we will see you know, a, a continuing challenge with regards to uh, how do we leverage the technology that is so quickly changing what we're doing, whether or not it's artificial intelligence, machine learning, whether or not it's encryption, whether or not it's future quantum, these are the things that we're going to have to master as first of all, a joint force, and then obviously a, as policymakers as well. So you've been very generous uh, with your time. So I'd like to um, close by uh, asking one last question that uh, in many ways is um, you know behind the scenes for uh, some in the audience, uh, particularly those at the start of their careers. Um, is there advice that you would give to someone uh, just entering the field of national and cybersecurity tips for, for how to thrive in the way that you have? So I, I think I'd begin, Peter, with the idea that um, treat, your, treat your work a, as both as a profession and as being a professional. Uh, one of the things that I think I've been the beneficiary of has been really a career of continued education. Uh, and whenever I was moving towards another rank or a new job, it seemed like the service had sent me back to further training. This is part of being a professional and being a profession. I've also had the, the great fortune to work with incredible leaders, uh, people that really set the tone both in the policy making and, and also the operational force. Uh, you know, a series of, uh, of different folks on the joint force, uh, a series of folks of army leaders, uh, whether or not it's been Keith Alexander or Stan McChrystal or others, they have really kind of shaped this idea of what a professional does and how they operate. The second piece is, is that I've learned from my experiences that uh, one of the key things that you have to bring to your work is passion. It's passion. I mean, you get up in the morning and what you do matters and you feel as though what you do matters and you get excited to go to work. Obviously, some days you're more excited than others. But the key to success here is that find something that you're passionate about. And when you find that passion, you know, continue to continue to look at being a professional and, and, and enhancing the profession. And the last thing I would share, and this is probably a bit parochial, but I think many in uh, uh, many with my experience would say the same thing. Uh, it comes back in many ways to small unit leadership. When you're a, a rising uh, cadet, uh, before you get commissioned, one of the things that they do is they teach you to be a small unit leader, a fire team leader, a squad leader. And those lessons have never really left me. Set the example, lead from the front, establish and maintain standards, being able to articulate guidance clearly, moral and physical courage, you know, it seemed like at the time when you're learning those things, okay, okay, I got it. But every single job, every single day that I, I, I spend here within the agency and command, I come back to this same principles. And so small unit leadership really was among the most essential things that I learned early in my career. General, thank you both for uh, spending time with us today and also all that you've done for the nation and cyberspace itself. Appreciate it. Thanks, Peter.